Good morning and half a day. The Committee on General Government Operation and Appropriation Housing is now called to order. Today is Wednesday, November 30th. The time now is 9 o'clock. Notice for this public hearing were disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on Thursday, November 17th, and then November 23rd. Again, today is Wednesday, November 30th, and it is now 9 o'clock. The uh, following items will be, will be heard this morning, specifically the, the appointment of Dr. Robert S. Jack uh, to the Guam Ethics Commission, a term length of four years. Those testifying on behalf of Dr. Robert Jack are invited to the panel, and they are Mr. Jesse Kinga, and we have Dr. Dr. Jack here, and we also have a Ruben uh, Bugarin. But I, I, are you are you going to be testifying or no? Okay, but you're here to support. Good job, thank you. Um, general rules for this public hearing: written testimony shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide my legislative staff with your written testimony for photocopying. Testimonies may be read, and lengthy testimony should be summarized to about five minutes. But if you need additional time, Ms. Uh, Dr. Jack will provide you, will allow you that additional time. Those testifying will be allowed to present oral testimony. Once you're done, please remain in the room for questions or for additional testimony as may be desired by members of the committee. Questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Personal inference as to the character or the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violation of the general rule of conduct will result in removal from the public hearing room. Proper form decorum shall be practiced by all present in the public hearing room for these proceedings. Individuals who fail to maintain proper form decorum may be or will be restricted from providing oral testimony and will be escorted from the room. When you speak, please make sure that the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone. Please state your name and your title for the record. I'd like to acknowledge the, my colleagues that have joined me. We have Senator Tello Tidegui and we have Senator Frank Bloss. And with that, I'd ask, uh, I normally would ask the appointee to provide his testimony, but I'm going to ask Mr. Kenga from the Ethics Commission to provide his testimony first, and I'm going to save you for last, Dr. Jack. Mr. Kenga, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Hoffman, good morning to Chairman Senator St. Augustine and Senators Frank Bloss Jr. and Tello Tidegui. My name is Jesse King. I'm the Executive Director of the Guam Ethics Commission, and I'm here to testify in support of Dr. Jack's confirmation. I offer this strong letter of support for the confirmation of Dr. Robert Jack to serve a second term on the Guam Ethics Commission. I have the deepest personal and professional respect for the commissioner. He is an intelligent, dedicated, passionate, and accomplished individual. In addition to his distinguished professional career, Commissioner Jack has gone above and beyond in service of our community. He currently serves as one of six inaugural members named and confirmed to the Guam Ethics Commission. In his role as a commissioner, he equally led and accomplished developing the mission of the commission and secure its first appropriation in the government of Guam's 2021 budget. Commissioner Jack further supported the formulation of the commission's public policy initiatives, which led to the enactment of two new public laws these include mandating ethics training for all employees of the government of Guam, Public Law 3625, and reaffirming the Guam Ethics Commission as an independent and autonomous agency within the government of Guam, Public Law 3628. Furthermore, Commissioner Jack's background and passion proved to be invaluable, um, an invaluable addition to a balanced and fair deliberation of all complaints heard by the commission. He was involved in preparing and approving the draft administrative rules pertaining to the execution of Chapter 15, Title IV, Guam Code Annotated. I therefore respectfully ask for the legislature's confirmation of his reappointment to the commission. Sujus Masi. Thank you, Mr. Kenga. Dr. Jack, sir, your, tes your testimony for your continuance <laughs> with the Ethics Commission, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, good morning, senators. It's a uh, privilege and a pleasure to be here to appear before you for this reappointment. Um, I am willing and able to answer any and all questions that you may have. I think the work of the Ethics Commission is uh, paramount, uh, particularly in the climate in which we find ourselves. Um, transparency is important and that's what we, try, we strive to achieve uh, in, the, in, in the work of the Commission. Uh, following all the, the laws that, that govern our, our operation. 
uh, it would be an honor for me to continue serving um, as a commissioner with the, with the current ethics um, commissioners that we have. So again, I feel uh, honored to be a part of this and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Jack. Senator Tello, do you have any questions for the Commissioner Jack? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning to my colleagues and good morning to those who are here present today. Um, so this is your second term, correct, uh, that, that you're going after? That is correct. So why, uh, why would you want to continue to serve, especially on this board? It's an important role, first of all. And I don't believe that I had the opportunity to do as much as I would have wanted to given the length of time it took for us to really get rolling for a number of reasons, um, particularly because of COVID. Um, we, it, it, thanks, I, I have to compliment uh, Mr. Kenga on his really hard, his, his diligence and hard work to really get us to where we are now. But it took a while for a number of reasons. So I don't think that any of the commissioners really had a chance to get into the actual work of the Ethics Commission until very recently. So I'd like to continue to see where that goes. With um, reading your application, I noticed you have no government background whatsoever. Not even, it doesn't show any like being part of any like Knights of Columbus or anything like that served in the art community. So this is the first time, um, according to your application, that you've done anything uh, for, the, for the community of Guam. How long have you been on Guam, by the way? Uh, I moved to Guam in 2007, so it's 2007. been 15 plus okay. years. 15. And you are correct, this is my first involvement with any sort of government agency. And how are you going, well, what have you been doing to kind of give more of a a perspective of a government employee by understanding government on Guam. Um, what have you done to, you know, uh, put you in as an expert, especially when it comes to making these decisions uh, for ethics? Um, I wouldn't consider myself an expert, first of all. Um, I do have a lot of experience with the community of Guam because of my role as an ophthalmologist. I interact with, you know, anywhere between 30 and 50 patients a day, along with their family members uh, for the last 15 years that I've been here. So I, ha I have a lot of interaction with the, with the, the citizens of Guam, the islanders, um, mostly locals, so I feel that I get a sense of uh, the type of community that I'm, I'm a part of now. I do think I bring to the table a sense of fairness um, as well as compassion. So those, those, are, those are my strengths. And Have I, think you, I, yeah, I think I can look at uh, whatever is presented from a, from a fair vantage point. Have you um, made any effort to read some of the reports coming out of civil service, the uh, civil service commission? I have not had a chance to read uh, in depth any of the reports coming out. Um, I have been apprised by Jesse of everything that's significant that should be of concern to the commissioners. And uh, I feel comfortable with, with uh, Jesse um, providing me the information that I need. You know, this board, Doctor, is a very important board. You know, it, it changes people's lives. It can change people's lives. And because of its importance, I think that all the commissioners, not just, you know, I'm not just picking on you right now, but I think all commissioners, should make an effort, a concerted effort to go beyond and, and really look at other obstacles or other, uh, not appointments, but uh, cases that have been, you know, 
through the Civil Service Commission to see what's been going on in that perspective and how they've been ruling and, you know, um, I just think there should be more emphasis on, on just educating yourself on, on that. I mean, you're a doctor, that's a totally different REM, <laughs> you know, that you deal with. And uh, so I think that I uh, appreciate the fact that you, you want to step up and serve again in the community of Guam. But I also think that there should be more of a concerted effort to, to you know, do more research on something as important as this. I mean, this is, a, again, I can't emphasize how important this board is because it does change people's lives. It can. So I appreciate again the opportunity. And Mr. Kinga, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to echo, I absolutely agree with that statement. And to provide more background to Dr. Jack's earlier response, uh, part of their initiative reflects on Title V's implementation of the Board and Commission's uh, board training. I think the Ethics Commission happens to be the only board to actually comply with that mandate. So they get together annually to talk about all significant updates, not just to uh, relevant case law and issues that deal with civil service, but they also deal with improvement and changes to the procurement law. We recognize that there are implications with procurement acts that might lead to an ethics investigation. So those are some concepts that um, you'll be pleased to hear uh, we actually get involved in, and that's through the leadership of the commission we have currently. Thank you, Mr. King. And you're up to date on your uh, website? Yes, we are. Okay, I'm looking at it right now. I just okay. wanted to make sure, because one thing about boards, they forget to update the website. I mean, you talk about transparency. This is the best way, so everyone knows what's going on. So again, Absolutely. thank you so much, and thank you for stepping up to the plate. Thank, thank you. you. And thank Senator Tidig, we on the website, I'm excited, maybe offline, Mr. Chair, I can share. Uh, we launched an online learning platform for ethics training so that government employees who happen to be doing shift work who can't attend a training in a regular eight to five work schedule can register online and attend an uh, asynchronous learning environment for yes, them to accomplish that. I noticed that very well. Sign up for training, online training, request for training. Yes. That's very good. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Senator. Chair. Thank you, Senator Tidewee. Senator Bloss, do you have any questions for the, appoint, the um, appointee, Dr. Jack? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. Dr. Jack, thank you very much for your willingness and you, to be able to, again, step up again and, and be reappointed. But you, um, not a matter of concern, okay, but uh, it's just for uh, you, you, when you've got an individual with you know, your expertise, your profession, Okay, and we're talking about now a commission, an ethics commission, okay, and being in an, an ethics commission. You know, talk about being, you know, your subject matter expert on one side, and okay, uh, and then an ethics commission, which any profession, you know, has its own ethical standards as well. So, in your own words, how would you f feel? you can contribute, or you, you have contributed, to the Ethics Commission um, based on your capacity and based on your ability and based on your experience. Uh, what, what, what value do you bring to that commission? The reason why I'm asking is a lot of times when you talk to, you know, we, 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 we talk to commission members or individuals who want to be part of a commission, there are subject matter of this and a subject matter that is very relevant to, to that commission itself or to that. Ethics is broad, okay? And, and so, uh, not, like I said, nothing to take away from what, you know, what you have, but I'm more interested in what you'll be able to provide. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate the question. Um, medical ethics is something that is very important in, uh, to me as a, as a professional, as a doctor, as a physician. Um, and there's so many, not, not everything is black and white. And I think you've got to come, you've got to approach um, any task knowing that there's quite a bit of gray in there. And I think I see my job as a commissioner as looking at all sides, considering the, the law, 
and what is considered fear. Um, and I would also lean on my, my age or maturity because I've, I've seen a lot and I've gone through a lot. Um, and I think I bring that to the table as a commissioner. Um, I agree, it's a very, very crucial role that we play. Um, and to, to reiterate, I don't think we've really, as commissioners, we've really had a chance to really delve into the issues um, before. Uh, because of the, the various hurdles that we had to overcome to really get to this point. So I'm anxious now to move forward and actually do the job of an ethics commissioner. I'm looking forward to that. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, I'm pretty much satisfied. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bloss. And Dr. Jack, um, I know in the beginning it, it, it took time first for the ethics commission to get its Get its program together, and it's moving forward. I'm, and I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. I'm just um, actually just waiting to see uh, who's going to start filing complaints, so the ethics commission can go to act, go to work. And I, I do look forward, and um, and I do support your appointment. Um, I haven't heard anything negative. I haven't seen anything negative, and. Uh, after this hearing, we'll prepare the, the committee report so we can submit it to the floor so we can get you reconfirmed, uh, hopefully, in this month during our session. Unless you have anything else to say, sir, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy you're willing to, come, to stay on. Really, that's one of the keys. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Senator. There's one additional comment that I'd like to make here. Um, I am hoping that with the, with the right um, training of all the government uh, employees um, when they have when they know what the laws are what the rules are what's ethical and what's not I'm hoping we're obsolete I'm hoping that we don't need to meet to discuss anything ethical I'm hoping that all the employees I mean it's a pipe dream but it's the one I have, that everybody knows what the rules are and that we all know the consequences and, and we can go from there. Yes, sir. And, and if need be, uh, if it's not in the law that everybody has to attend it, not just elected and management, maybe, maybe that's something we can be discussing in the near future with my colleagues because we'll be returning in January and then we can pursue that. But other than just drug testing, ethics training. Everybody's got to register because you got the online. There's, they're running out of excuses not to go to the course. And we can make that and make them report out or have you folks report out to the legislature that the following numbers are going through it and it's positive. Sending the strong message is the best, it's the best way to do this. Education. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jack. And with that, there being no uh, additional individuals to testify, for uh, Dr. Jack, or for or against, the committee will, 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 may submit, any individual may submit testimony to the, the mail room or the Guam Legislature or through my email at senatorjoesanagustine at gmail.com. And again, I want to thank everyone for attending this public hearing and for, and for providing feedback and suggestions. The referral of appointment of Dr. Robert S. Jacks, duly heard by the Committee on Public, and the public hearing is now adjourned. The time now is 9.20. Thank you, Dr. Jack, Mr. Kenga. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Please have a nice day. Take care. We'll just take a two-minute recess. We get ready for the next bill, which is Bill 363, and then immediately after that, we will follow up with uh, Bill 348, Senator Tello's bill. All right? Thank you. Get a couple-minute recess.
Good morning and half a day. The Committee on General Government Operation and Appropriation Housing is now called to order. Today is Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. And the time now is 9.24. Notice for this public hearing were disseminated via email to all centers and all main media broadcasting outlets on Thursday, November 17th and November 23rd. Again, today is Wednesday, November 30th, and it's 9.24. The bill that we'll be hearing this morning is Bill Number 363-36-COR, introduced uh, authored by Senator Frank Bloss, Jr., co-sponsored by Senator Tony Adda, Vice Speaker Tina Rose Moon and Barnes, Senator uh, Speaker Therese Terlai, Senator Joanne Brown, Senator Tello Tadigui, Senator Mary Camacho Torres, and Senator Chris Duenas, and also Senator Clint Rogel. An act to add a new section 421 to Chapter 4 of the Title I Guam Code Ante to adopt the Guam World War II Memorial Flag as an official flag for Guam in honor of all tomorrows who died during or survived the enemy occupation of Guam during World War II, December 1941 to September 1945, and to authorize that it be flown alongside or right below the official flag of Guam from June 28 to August 10 and or December 8 of every year and during any event that recognizes or honors a Guam World War II survivor. The physical note for Bill 363-36 was requested on November 18th Receive and disseminate to all senators via email by the Committee on Rules on November 22nd. Those testifying on behalf of Bill 363-36 are invited to the panel, and she is Monica Guzman. She's here to support it, and with that, we'll, we'll move to the general rules for this public hearing. Written testimony shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide my relative staff with your written testimony for photocopying. Testimony may be read, and then the testimony should be summarized to about five minutes. Those testifying will be allowed to present oral testimony. Once you are done, please remain in the room for question or for additional testimony as may be desired by members of the committee. Questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Personal inference as to the character or the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violation of this general rule of conduct will result in removal from the public hearing room. Proper form and decorum shall be practiced by all present in the public hearing room for these proceedings. Individuals who fail to maintain proper form of the court may be will be restricted from providing oral testimony and will be escorted from the room. When you, speak, when you speak, please make sure that the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone. Please state your name and your title for the record. I'd like to acknowledge the, my colleagues that have joined me this morning. We have Senator Frank Bloss and Senator Tello Tidewe. I'd ask um, Senator Bloss to please give his opening statement and then we'll proceed with Ms. Uh, Guzman making her giving her testimony. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for all that are in attendance today. Thank you, Ms. Guzman, for, for, for being here to it as well. Uh, Bill 363-36 COR um, very simply is, is an act that would be able to create and, and officially recognize a flag to honor Guam's World War II survivors uh, and those who not only survived but who, unfortunately who had passed, who had perished during the war. Uh, to continue to, to pay homage, uh, honor, and respect uh, to, to these individuals who we've characterized and we've recognized as Guam's greatest generation. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this bill came about as a result of discussions that uh, I had um, as I'm taking off my hat now as, as, as basically the founder of the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation, um, along with um, former Senator and chairman of the Menengan Memorial Foundation, uh, former Senator Willie Flores. And ironically, it was an event that we were both sitting at uh, and in an, an observation of, again, um, uh, you know, our, those who had suffered and died through, through uh, World War II. And our discussion quickly went to what other ways, what better ways can we continue to honor our survivors, uh, you know, past many of the events that they have, or just so that we, as a, as a reminder, not just to our island, uh, to our people, but to to the world, of what has happened, what happened on Guam uh, from uh, December of 1941 to September of 1945. Uh, you know, during those times, Guam, our people of Guam, were the only population where the uh, was the only community you know uh, attached if you will to the United States that has ever been occupied by an enemy force in any war that the United States has ever been in 
Um, our people were subjected to suffrages, pain, death, uh, and a lot of times because of their loyalty they had, not just to their country, but to their people, to, 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 to the people of the island. And in this, we, what we wanted to do is basically an opportunity to create a lasting legacy and a lasting reminder, um, you know, for, for, for our island, to, to, for our people, of what our people had to endure uh, during those trying times. Uh, what this, this conversation quickly went to um, meeting with a locally known artist, uh, Mr. Ron Castro, uh, who has assisted in being able to develop the concept of what the flag design would be. What we wanted to provide is basically something that was simple yet very profound um, in, uh, in its uh, depiction, uh, you know, on the flag. And, and something that can be relatable to, to, to our island. And so, you know, in keeping with, and if you can re recall, first off, um, our, the official seal of Guam, our Guam flag, you know, with the palm tree or the coconut tree and uh, our, the eastern or, or the western cliff lines uh, of Guam, with, uh, primarily, you know, Punta de los Montes or Two Lovers Point. We wanted that same kind of a concept, but also recognizing what it was for, Hasu. We use the word Hasu in, in, in this. Hasu and tomorrow means remember. Uh, and remember, and then right below the word Hasu is the, is the, is the, uh, the years 1941 to 1945. Remember 1941 to 1945, what happened on Guam. Remember that. Remember that in, in, in behalf uh, and in honor of, of those who had died and suffered through, through, through that war. Um, there are some people that have asked, why did we take 1945? Well, if you take a look at the Hopkins report that was conducted, the, Hopkins, the investigation and the report that was conducted in 1947, first off, our, while our island was, for lack of a better term, liberated uh, in 1944, many of our people were still suffering in 1945. As a matter of fact, there were still individuals that were uh, that were severely injured or killed as a result of still sporadic gunfire, um, the uh, you know, and the, and having to be victimized or or or, or uh, stepping over the ornament or the the, the uh, armaments, the the uh, shells, unexp un unexploded ordinances that still remain, that continue to remain on this island, um, and so. You know, when you take a whole population, when you take a whole community who was so basically liberated in 1944, it wasn't just, okay, war's in it, go back, to home, go back home, let's go back to our lives. They had to rebuild their lives. They had to rebuild their lives. They had to rebuild their homes. They had to find their family. There are many stories that we've heard of, 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 of young children who, you know, were staying with, with, with relatives or friends until they could find their parents. And that continued to exist past, you know, the August 10, 1944, uh, if you will, deadline or, 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 or interpretation of when the, the war ended on Guam. It did not end in, in 1944. Okay? It was still, there was still suffering in 1945. And so what this flag represents is a homage and a tribute to those who died and suffered through World War II, the occupation of Guam by uh, enemy forces during World War II. So what this, this bill would do was, is basically recognize that there is a flag, what the flag will look like, the dimensions, the design of the flag, and when the flag is authorized to be, is authorized to be, uh, to be flown. The bill calls for the flag to be flown every June 28 to August 10, and every December 8th of every year. Why those dates? June 28 was the date that we recognized Guam War Survivors Memorial Remembrance Day. August 10 is the day that we 
basically pay homage and tribute to those individuals who uh, died at, uh, uh, and were, were killed in Tiguyen. Those are traditionally on, on our island, um, those dates that we use to remember what had happened um, uh, during World War II. Why December 8? Guam was invaded. Guam was, 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 was captured and was invaded by, by the enemy forces on December 8th. Uh, so uh, th those are the, the official dates that uh, we will, it will, will be recognized as the official dates that we can fly the flag, as well as uh, any time that there is an honor, we're paying homage or we're paying honor to not just our survivors, but to what had happened uh, during World War II here in Guam. So, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, that's what this, this bill is for, and um, I really would like um, support on this uh, on this on this uh, bill, so that we can continue um, to pay uh, you know our respect to our gener the generations that have to live through that, but so to ensure that the generations that come after us. We'll never forget what happened on Guam. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Blas. Ms. Guzman. Good morning, buenas, half a day, uh, Senator Blas, uh, Senator St. Augustine, and Senator Tidegui. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present um, today in support of Bill 336, 363-36COR. My name is Monica Okada Guzman, Tau Tau Mangilao. I'm here to support the passage of this bill um, to create a flag um, that will honor those that, uh, that we call the greatest generation of all for our future is, is a visual recognition of the suffering and the strength of our people of Guam. It's a beautiful flag. Um, it's very clean, and as far as the design, I, I, I think it's a beautiful flag. And, you know, today there are many people on Guam, our children, our grandchildren, that don't understand what happened during the war. You know, they just know that, you know, World War II was here on Guam. But I think this will be a visual recognition and a visual reminder to everyone that our people did suffer, and through the strength of our culture, through the strength of our faith, and through the strength of our people, we were able to uh, survive and rebuild, as Senator Blas said. You know, it, it was part of rebuilding our island, rebuilding our families, rebuilding our, our lives. And um, I visualize 10, 15, 20 years from now, these flags hanging flying all over the island and it'll just be a visual reminder for our kids because they you know they read about it they hear about it but to have a visual reminder and it's it, it's so beautiful and you know the collaboration of the guam war survivors memorial with the menangan memorial foundation i mean that's how things get done here on Guam, it's through partnerships, through relationships, through collaborations. And now with the support of the Guam legislature, I ask that you pass this bill so that, you know, today is November 30th. I don't know, um, Senator Blas, if we have flags to hang on December 8th, because it says here, um, and I don't know if this will be done in, in time for, for December 8th, but um, I think it's just a very uh, good, um, it's a very good example of what can happen with collaboration, with partnership to honor um, our people. There have been many uh, events and activities that have happened over the course of the years. This year is the 78th anniversary of the liberation of Guam, and it's just appropriate that we do this now. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Ms. Guzman. Senator Taitigui, do you have any comments you'd like to make on, on this bill, 363? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, Monica. Thank you for being here and providing some, you know, history and, and the importance of, of remembering uh, our greatest heroes. Uh, my father is 93 years old, and he's a survivor. And his story, though it hasn't been told in some books, but his story is, and he's told us children how he had to carry the mines 
you know, with his other cousins taking it from Inalahan and walking all the way to Chalampago holding these mines during the war. Every time we drive down to Inalahan, he always tells me other stories too, and then the same one's over, but you know, his, his memory is good. Um, when this bill came up, my father uh, called me to ask me about uh, who made the design for this flag. And um, he asked me, because he couldn't be here today, you know, and I wish we could do Zoom, Mr. Chair. <laughs> We'd probably get more people showing up at these public hearings if, if we allow Zoom. But um, he knew I was co-sponsor of it. And he understands the intent and the meaning and, and to show the respect of those who've passed away and those who are still alive. But he asked the question of, about the design of the flag. What he saw, he felt, was not really showing the suffering that our people had gone through. A flag like that, if we want to remember, we want to be able to look at the design and, and see it without words the suffering our people went through, and to remember them. So he had asked if there was any, like, he goes, was there a contest? Could we got involved or to, to draw anything, you know, to actually have put it in front, uh, samples to be put in front of those who are still alive today? Because if anybody's been through, uh, you know, something so traumatic like that and, and look at a design and it reminds them, then those are the ones that should depict the, what design that flag should be. So are you familiar with any of um, how this design came about on the flag? Um, Senator, I think that um, the design in front of us is a very clean and, um, you know, it, it, it's very clean and it reminds us of our, you know, the symbolism stated in the bill, I believe, is, is, um, is powerful, is very powerful. And, you know, we need to move forward. Um, yes, we rebuilt and we, we rebuilt our lives, we rebuilt our island, um, but, you know, every, every liberation, personally, I go through a very emotional time because I, am part Japanese, you know, and for many years I went through this um, inner turmoil because of my Japanese heritage. You know, I've been involved with the Guam Nike Association and I've learned that, you know, war does a lot of things to, to people and people do things during war that under normal circumstances they probably wouldn't do and war, war's crazy. War's, is, is, is terrible, but I've learned that we need to look forward, we need to remember, and I, that's why I like the fact that it, it has the word hasu in it because we have to remember, but we also have to look forward and we have to move forward. Um, and I think, you know, I think the word itself, hasu, is, 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 is very uh, symbolic. Okay, let me, let me ask that question again. Do you know if the design of the flag was done in a way to involve other, like our survivors today, to make a choice on what the flag should look like? Are you aware of that? Just yes or no? Um, I think that the artist that was involved is very, um, uh, I mean, I know Ron personally. And Who? I, the, the artist. Who's the artist? The um, senator said it was uh, Ron Castro. Ron Castro, yeah, okay. So I, I know him personally. Okay, why don't I ask you this? He, so there was none. Um, do you think that that should be done with this flag, that um, different designs should be created and then given to our current survivors uh, to have them the opportunity to choose which flag should be the flag that represents what they went through, the trials, the tribulations, the atrocities that they went through um, to pick. Do you think that should happen? I think the collaboration between the two nonprofits, 
I think is a very strong. Yeah, but these nonprofits were not part of the war. They didn't, you know, they didn't experience the war. Ron Castro was never in the war. That's why I'm saying, don't you think we should have those who are living today decide what that flag should look like? Or at I, least choose, have some choice in the matter? I think, I think the, the collaboration, I think the, the, the effort between the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation and the Menengan Memorial Foundation, I think it's a, it's a, a great collaboration. And the concept of, of creating a flag um, is very noble and is, is very positive. And I think, I, I believe that what the design that we have here is, is, is very clean, it's very beautiful. And the word itself, hasu, you know, um, okay. I yeah. think that, 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 that we have something in front of us and I believe that, it, that it's beautiful. Okay. You know, um, I don't, but, like, I, like I said so earlier. So you're not going to answer my question, Monica. The, the question is, I asked, well, okay, you're not answering my question. If these, you know, the Armanamku, those who, who were in the war, uh, should actually have an opportunity to look at different designs and, and choose from there. You mentioned earlier, you know, to have this bill passed, you know, uh, I, I don't, I think something is important is there's no doubt in my mind, you know, I signed up on this because I think we should remember them and always remember them. And when my father, you know, um, his, his time to meet his maker is gone, I don't have those stories being told to me anymore. They won't be. But every time I'll see a flag that flies on that day, I'll remember my dad and what he went through. I mean, that's the whole purpose of this. And that's why I signed up on this bill. But I really think that we shouldn't rush this because there are people out there, my father included, who want to have a say on what this flag should look like because they're the ones that experience the war, not Wilf Flores or, or you know, Rick Castro. I mean, they could hear the stories too and try to provide something close to it. But I really think it should be those who are living today who went through that to look at a flag. So I, I'm just going to leave it at that because you said earlier it might not get passed by December 8 to put it out. If it doesn't, it's, I'm fine with it. As long as we put something up there that's going to be there forever. It's, we're not going to change this. Once this flag comes up, we're not going to turn around and change it. It's going to be there forever because we don't have that many survivors left on our island. So I would just want to do it right the first time. And I'm already hearing from our survivors now that they want a choice on what this flag should look like. So I thank you so much for being here. And I, I truly, I am, I'm with you 100% that we should always remember what had happened. And, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Tidewe. Senator Blouse, do you have any questions you would like to pose before well, I do the closing? Well, I, I just like to be able, and thank you very much to, to my colleague for, the, the, for registering the concern, and I recognize and I appreciate it, okay? Uh, Mr. <laughs> it's my dad, okay? I understand. <laughs> I understand that full well, okay? And I, I, I want to give two assurances to, to your father and to any uh, survivors that, uh, and, and individuals who, uh, who are watching in, uh, um, you know, this, this hearing. First off, as was mentioned by, uh, by Ms. Guzman here, of the collabor collaboration between the two organizations. Um, you're right, you know, um, in, in neither of the organizations, actually, I, there, I, I stand corrected, you know. The Menengan Memorial Foundation was founded with individuals who were members, survivors of the war. Um, the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation has its own for lack of a better term, informal board uh, with, with uh, war survivors that, that are there. And I think that through experience um, and recognizing that there's never going to be a complete consensus of what, you know, the, in this case, the flag should look like. What we wanted to present is pro provide is, again, a simple yet profound um, design uh, for, for this flag so that it provides the opportunity and provides that, that, that necessity to remember. 
Um, some individuals have gruesome memories of the war. Some were too young to even remember what happened during the, the war. Some did not, never have, will never have the opportunity to be able to contribute to what their experiences were in the war. And so what this flag in its design represents is, is a interpretation, for lack of a better term, or a symbol so that it, we remember what has happened here, what, or we learn what has happened here and remember what has happened here uh, back in World War II. Monica, you brought up a very good point here in that you know, many of our, many individuals in our younger generation in Guam don't even fathom that a war existed here. It's very hard to fathom that over 80 years ago, one of the most, the, one, the very first battle that occurred on this island during that occupation was right here, was in this vicinity. The last defense of Guam before its surrender was right here. We're standing and we're sitting in these hollowed grounds for that purpose. And what this flag will do is will help us and would hopefully generate the interest in future generations and in this current generation to look back into the history and see what has happened so that it doesn't happen again. And we pray that it doesn't happen again. So I can appreciate that there is concern as to whether or not this is a true interpretation or it truly depicts what the island had to suffer through. And if we were to think, okay, we can do, go about it a better way. We had two organizations that collaborated on this. The two organizations that this community has looked to to be able to continue to remember these events and to honor our survivors. And I put it out to any detractor, okay, on whether or not we should even create a flag to do this. Because you can do better. Or you can do more. It's not for the survivors to do this, it's for us so that we can honor them. It took us over 60 years to come up with an organization that honors our survivors. What happened before then? We don't know how long, quite honestly, the Guam Mar Survivors Memorial Foundation will continue to exist or the Menengan Memorial Foundation. But what we wanted to do is make it a lasting legacy. That even if these organizations were to go to pass on, that there is continuous, a continuous reminder for that. So I can respect and I honor and appreciate that the design could be even more. And it could, it could have been. But I, I believe in introducing this legislation, I believe in the, after the collaboration that was done, that it would be, represent the honor and respect that our, those that survived or those that died through the war are gonna continue to get perpetually.
So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Bloss. Um, I'm in support of this uh, having a flag. I'd be a strong supporter of having another flagpole erected so that it's adjacent to the Guam and the U.S. flag. Not below any Guam flag, because why? Um, and I'll make sure it's part of the committee report, the history of the Guam flag, how it started, 1917 and forward. And we're talking about something that, uh, and I'll ask the AV to please uh, display, this is what the flag will look like that's being, that's on the bill. And I ask the audience, and the public, and the Manamku, take a look at it. Because I know for a fact when my parents were alive, and they were war survivors, I'd ask him about the war. And he said, it's not something to, we need to talk about, but I'll tell you a little bit, boy. I helped build the, the runway up at uh, the airport. I have families that, that walk in England. It's not something, maybe my father would not, if he was alive today, he wouldn't want a picture about the war zone look like. Hasu, and I think that's the key here. Think about it, and, I, and I, I've had it posted now. I would ask the uh, audience, the public, we we'll wait a few days, get a few days for, to keep the bill open, and then we'll present, then I'll ask the uh, author of the bill how far he wants to move on it. And if he wants to move on it, we'll, move, we'll, we'll submit the committee report and we'll move from there. But for me, uh, the message is to remember. That's all, it's all, that's all the message is. Because there are many things in everybody's life nobody wants to look at those pictures anymore. It's a memory and we leave it alone. And we cherish it and we move on from there. Some we don't care to cherish, but we move on from there. And with that, there's no additional testimonies. Uh, okay. But the uh, committee will continue to accept testimony. Please submit it to the mail room of the Guam legislature or through email at senatorjoesanogsin at gmail.com. I think, Senator Bloss, uh, you gave your closing, correct? You, you have something to say? Yes, Ms. Ms. Guzman. Uh, sir, if I may, I would just like to add one more thing um, to my testimony. And um, I... I what Senator Blas said about the collaboration I think is very important, and, and then your comments also about Hasu. But I also want to bring up that all of the mayors created a village flag for all of the villages, and that was done, what, maybe 10, 12 years ago? And that flag is a source of pride for all of the villages, and they all have their own individual seal, their own individual flag, their own village flower, village, you know, all the sites and everything. Um, and to me, Hasu is very important, like you said. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's a, a very simple but very unique um, reminder, visual reminder. And so I, I really hope and, 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 and uh, that, that you will support passage of this bill. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Again, I want to thank everyone for attending this public hearing and for providing feedback and suggestion. Bill 363-36 COR is duly heard by the committee and the public hearing is now adjourned. It is now 9.58. And Sijus Masi, and we'll take a a, a few minute recess before we begin Bill 348 on the, uh, from Senator Taro Tariwi. Thank you.
Half a day and good morning. The Committee on General Government Operation, Appropriation, and Housing is now called to order. Today is Wednesday, November 30th. The time now is 10.07. Public notice, notice for the public hearing were disseminated via email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on Thursday, November 17th, and on November 23rd. Again, today is Wednesday, November 30th, and it is now 10.07. The bill we'll be hearing now is Bill 348-36 LS, introduced by Senator Tello Tadigui, co-sponsored by Senator Frank Bloss, Senator Clint Rigel, and Senator Tony Ada, Senator Sabina Perez, and Senator Brown. I'd like to add section, a new section, 58128.7 to Article 1 of Chapter 58, Title 12, Guam Code Antid, relative to mitigating the housing affordability crisis by authorized tax incentive for eligible business entities that construct a minimum number of affordable housing units and to, and to creating the Affordable Housing Assistance Fund and to require the deposit of affordable housing business previous tax payments into the Affordable Housing Assistance Fund. There was a physical note requested and it was achieved and disseminated to all senators on November 10. Those testifying on behalf of Bill 348-36 are invited to the panel and they are Mr. Carlos Camacho, um, Blue Water Realty, Glenn Manglonia, Blue Water Realty. We have Gita Representative. We have Matt um, Baza and Mr. Carlos Berdalio from Gita. And with that, I will start with the general rules for this public hearing. Written testimony shall be submitted to the committee. Please provide my legislative staff with your written testimony for photocopying. Testimony may be read and lengthy testimony should be summarized to about five minutes. Those testifying be allowed to present oral testimony. Once you're done, Please remain in the room for questions or for additional testimony may be desired by members of the committee. Question and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Personal inference as to the character, the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violation of this general rule of conduct will result in removal from the public hearing room. Proper form and quorum shall be practiced by all present in the public hearing room for these proceedings. Individuals who fail to maintain proper form and quorum may be will be restricted from oral testimony and will be escorted from the room. When you speak, please make sure that the microphone is on and that you speak into the microphone. Please state your name and your title for the record. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues that have joined me this morning. We have Senator Tello Tadigui, the author of the bill, and Senator Frank Bloss, co-sponsor of the bill. And with that, I ask um, Senator Tadigui uh, to please uh, give her, uh, present her open statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for um, scheduling this public hearing on Bill 348 and for the opportunity to introduce the measure. Mr. Chair, Bill 348 proposes to increase the affordable housing inventory on Guam, especially at a time when the price of a single family home continues to increase, becoming out of reach to families across our island who are already struggling with higher food, fuel, health care, and energy costs. According to the article published by a local media company on October 3rd, 2022, Guam, especially at a time when the price of single family homes continue to increase, becoming out of reach for families across our island who are already struggling. And according to the media release, for a single family dwelling has reached $426,000 a substantial increase from the media price of 220, 299 in the pre-pandemic 2019 and 335 in 2020. The 2020 figure represents a 12% increase from 380 in 2021, 380,000 that is in 2001. If approved, Bill 348 prioritizes homeowners for families who are hoping to buy a home in today's tough housing market, but find it difficult to do so, as home prices are rising faster than they're able to set aside enough money for the closing costs. Mr. Chair, under Guam law, developers that build at least 25 affordable housing units are eligible for incentives, including BPT, income, real property, and use tax benefits. Bill 348 proposes to extend these tax benefits to eligible developers in exchange for construction, constructing no less 
than five affordable housing units. However, Mr. Chair, Bill 348 recognized there are smaller construction companies out there who, when compared to other companies that have already the capacity and resources to build a, a minimum of 25 affordable homes units, may have interest in doing their small part to increase the inventory of affordable housing units on Guam. And this bill provides the opportunity for them to do so. Mr. Chair, Bill 348 requires that for developers engaging in the construction of not less than five, but fewer than 25 affordable housing units, the BPT payments that are generated from the purchase or construction of an affordable housing unit shall be deposited into Affordable Housing Assistant Fund. Instead of providing a developer a 100% BPT abatement, Bill 348 proposes to use the BPT as a valid funding source to help qualified borrowers close their home loan by requiring funds to be applied to their down payment slash closing cost requirements. I'll give two examples of how I believe Bill 348 will help our families reach the finish line and secure a home through proposed use of BBT proceeds from down payment slash closing cost requirements. Example one, construction cost, $300,000. BPT, $15,000. Total, $315,000. Uh, 315, 6% bank closing is at $18,900. Less BPT assistance would yield 15000 and out of pocket for that first time homeowner or the homeowner who wants to purchase is only $3,900. I'll give you an example on, on construction cost for um, a $250,000 home. The BBT would yield $12,500. Total is $262,500. 6% banking closing cost is $15,750. Less BBT assistance negative 12,500, out of pocket for that person is 3,900. Additionally, Mr. Chair, Bill 348 requires GITA to develop an application process and the, the appropriate rules and guidelines necessary to facilitate BPT deposits and financial assistance for down payment and other closing costs for qualified first time home borrowers. Each payment shall be made to a financial institute through escrow and only after the borrower has met all eligibility requirements established by GITA. Mr. Chair, Bill 348 recognizes the urgency of using every policy at our disposal as a government, as we've done in the past to include direct appropriation to Guam Housing Corporation and the use of escheated funds to help families get past the finish line, particularly when inflation continues to push the finish line further from them. Between 2012 and 2022, 6.3 million in first-time homeowners assistance program grants issued by the Guam Housing Corporation to 784 families yielded approximately $153 million in additional economic activity through services associated with real estate, banking, escrow, appraisers, and title business transactions. The housing affordability crisis facing our island creates a huge barrier for families who work hard every day to raise their children, secure a good job, and put some money aside to build a home. Bill 348 invests in our families and will lead to new communities, which means additional economic activity in the form of new or expanded grocery and retail stores, telecommunication providers, and restaurants. So Mr. Chair, I look forward to the discussions, including any amendments that may be needed going forward, including recommendations I received via email from GIDA on the possibility of assigning the Guam Housing Corporation instead of GIDA, the responsibility of administering 
the proposed affordable housing QC program, including management of the proposed affordable housing assistant fund. So I thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to do this, and I'm looking forward to the comments being made today to strengthen this bill for our families on Guam. So do All right. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. We have uh, three individuals who testified, actually really two, assisted by uh, Mr. Baza. So well, why don't we go ahead and we'll, before we we'll have Gita start out, Mr. Bernardi, sir. Just turn on the mic, please. Samia. Okay. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, half a day, Senator Josie, Joe S. St. Augustine. Joe T. is your dad. <laughs> and members of the Committee on, Committee on General Government Operations, Appropriations, and Housing. And thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on Bill 34836-LS. Gita supports the bill's efforts to encourage the construction of additional affordable housing units in Guam. Current Guam law allows for contractors and developers to receive a qualifying certificate for the construction of affordable housing as long as no less than 25 affordable housing units are built. Bill 348 seeks to expand the affordable housing QC program by establishing an income tax rebate and use tax exemption for contractors and develop developers that construct no less than five but no greater than 24 affordable housing units. Based on our review of the bill, the tax benefits proffered are in line with ex existing law, and the bill contains adequate language to define the eligibility requirements for this specific QC activity. However, Gita has some concerns with the proposed affordable housing assistance fund that Bill 348 seeks to establish. First, there is some question as to the implication of the rerouting of the total sum of business privilege taxes from these projects to the fund. The BPT bonds specifically pledge a portion of the BPT for uh, debt service. Bills introduced since the issuance of the BPT bonds for brand new tax credits or abatements specifically limit those activities to unpledged BBT. GITA recommends similar language in Bill 348 to avoid any ambiguity. Second, the goals and activities of the fund seem to, seem to supplement efforts of already existing government of Guam programs to assist first-time first homeowners, such as GITA is aware that the government, the, the Guam Housing Corporation does already have some similar program. As such, there should be an evaluation for any duplication of efforts with this new program. Likewise, as the experts on housing in Guam, Gita defers to GHC and the Guam Housing and Urban Renewal Authority for their guidance on housing needs in Guam and recommends they administer this new program. As always, Gita stands ready to assist this committee as the bill moves through the legislative process. If you have any questions regarding my testimony, please feel free to contact me. And um, I'm reading this on behalf of our administrator, Mel Mendiola. Thank you, sir. Senator, uh, I mean, correction, uh, Mr. Camacho. Carlos, do you have any uh, testimony you want to provide? I think uh, that you're done, right? You're good. Okay. Sen uh, Mr. Camacho. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Senator San Augustine, Senator Frank Blas, Senator Teletairui. For many, many years, I, before I read my testimony, I've been an advocate on affordable housing on different venues through this August body. And many times, I just want to recollect one little story before I read my testimony, and it's probably in here already. Senator Teletairui mentioned some framework of some of my Framework, I guess we're all thinking the same way, but uh, I guess I'll repeat it. But in 2012, as she mentioned, Senator Ben Pangolina introduced the first uh, 500,000 seed money for the down payment and closing cost program, as Carlos uh, Berdalio mentioned, that Guam Housing was administering. It was very successful. 
after that funds ran out, uh, it came back to the legislature to try to find a sustainable funding source. And what Senator Tidegree mentioned, the Cheetah Fund, I would like to thank previous uh, existing senators. Uh, she was chairwoman of housing also, Tina Barnes, and Speaker Wampat, who, and Director of DOA Tony Bloss at that time, where we identified the cheated funds. And at that time, we had over $3 million. It was a very difficult source of funds because they were saying, what do we rather pay? Give it to Guam Housing for the down payment program, or shall we pay down the deficit at that time? It was a debate amongst the 15 senators then. Fortunately, it went through, and I'm glad as Senator Tidegui reported, and Guam Housing got in their books, year to date, from 2012, starting from the seed money, the 500,000, to the multi-million dollars of SGD funds has been transferred in up to 2022, it helped over 784 families, and that $6 million worth of funds yielded 153 million of construction and real estate purchase. Now, Carlos brought up a great point uh, that we gotta be just very careful how we put the language so we don't violate the 3% of the 5% bond because of what we secured many, many years ago for the tax refund. I just wanna make it very clear, there are no, these revenues as generated the BPT is starting from ground zero. There's, we are not taking from any BPT revenue source. This is new economic revenue to entice the same example I just gave you earlier on the cheated funds. So it's gonna be an economic multiplier. Yes, that's why the original QC1, now where it says 25 homes or more, I, w I wanted to also identify the DNA and the founder of that uh, format, Public Law 23195, or 23135, I'm sorry, was introduced by Senator Joe T. San Augustine, your dad, <laughs> and Francis Santos, another uh, great timer that with Governor Ada introduced the Kahat program that's being administered by Guam Housing Corporation. Well, that was the gist of the 25 home minimum affordable housing program 26 years ago, 26 years ago. From that format, Senator Tony LaMarena on the 24th legislature introduced 24266, made further amendments to the 25 home minimum of your debt, Senator Sanogsi 23135. And basically, that was the gist. Now, when you go 25 homes or more, then you gotta, of course, have, it's big pockets, big developer doing it. Years and years later, after we seen that, uh, as you guys described and watched, the, sh the inventory shortfall, the rising cost of home, right? How do we get these smaller contractors to get involved. I did chat with Matt here from Gita and Ed Camacho from Gita many months ago, and your office, Senator Sanoxin also, uh, before this bill was introduced by Senator Tidegui. Uh, um, what is the framework? I'm not a bill writer, but I can provide ideas to your policy guys, and that's why this came about. And we're still polishing it up with a recommendation by Gita. And that's when Matt and Ed said, you know, we gotta have a, some type of number threshold. So I figured five units and below 24 as the idea. And this is what this bill's framework's all about. Hopefully, what will happen here is this will entice the smaller contractors to get involved. Now, the original QC1, the 25 homes or, low, or below, has a four-legged tax benefit, a BPT exemption, which means zero, a user tax exemption, 
and two other, I think, real property and corporate tax exemption. What we were looking for is a sustainable source of funding to have the same economic multiplier as what this same August body did when they appropriated these cheated funds. And I'm glad from 2012 to 2022, you did 153 million as Senator Tadigui described. Now those are the uh, other vendors that are paying BPT that was not part of it. If you entice construction activity, entice escrow accounts, entice real estate agents involved, all those guys are paying. We're not asking an exemption from them. The exemption is coming from the other layer of the, of the format, which is the contractor or developer selling the home or building the home. But you've got to remember, it's tied to an approval if Mr. or Mrs., I guess an example, John Doe gets a loan approval from the bank to close their loan. And when they get their approval, they'll go to, in this case, as law will say, to Gita for assistance. And the reason it was written at that time to Gita is, yes, Carlos Berdalio is correct. The program already exists at Guam Housing Corporation. But Guam Housing Corporation has a rules and regs because that funding source came from the cheated funds. And it was capped at 10000 And if you look at the history on that source, Guam Housing Corporation had to come back three times to this body to keep increasing that cap because of the inflationary rate, as the senator described, the rising cost of construction. And to this body, Senator uh, Sanogsin, you gave the authority of the Guam Housing Board to have their own decision based on the area median cost of home so they don't have to keep coming back to the legislature to keep amending it. This is why... In this particular bill, we decided to use, as we did in a previous Manamco bill earlier, the area media income bill approach. Under the area median income approach, you're targeting the low, the moderate, I mean the, the medium and the moderate. And in my testimony, which I provided, it has the published income tables from HUD, from USDA, uh, as what's established every quarter of the year uh, when it gets adjusted, when both federal agencies are adjusted for the Western Pacific. Why that format is very important is one of the questions in the many, many years is they keep asking, so what's the right number? Is 100,000 the right number? Is 200,000 the right number as affordability? Well, as we've seen in the down payment and closing costs of Guam housing, when the idea was great and it was capped at 200,000 at that time, but they couldn't service the people because people's cost of construction was 250, then it went to 300. So this legislative body keeps amending the law until again, as I suggest, as I stated earlier, you guys gave the flexibility of the Guam Housing Board to finally make that decision. So by using an income published threshold, everybody's income will first meet the low, moderate income table, and everybody who maintains their credit rating or lowers their debt ratio will then borrow based on what they can, their capacity is. As long as they meet the definition of first-time homeowner and meet the income limits. But I wanted to assure uh, I am aware of the 3% of the 5%. A QC1 already exempts the BPT for 25 homes, so they don't pay BPT. From 5 to 25, we're taking out the one-legged benefit and making it becoming a sustainable revolving fund so that funds can be available when that applicant is ready to close their loan. And when they close the loan, it becomes an economic multiplier, as uh, we've seen in these cheetah funds. So therefore, I, uh, with the uh, recommended amendment that GITA will provide, and this committee will uh, change to Guam Housing Corporation, other than GITA administering it, I do support that idea because Guam Housing already seen the process. 
I've talked to Guam Housing about this bill over the week before this came in, and the only one thing they ask, and I, I, that will be up to this body, is that, that can they put some type of verbiage on no double dipping? I'm not sure what that means, but they further describe what that means. So if Mr. and Mrs. John Cruz build a home for 200000 and the BPT is 5% is 10,000. They'll get a 10,000 automatic revolving fund to their closing. But what they wanted, what Guam Housing wanted was, it doesn't say here that they, will, they can still apply at Guam Housing for the other assistance. So they'll get another 10,000. So they just wanted to make sure there's no double dipping, but I'm not sure how to write that part. I'm just suggesting what they brought up to, to me, and I said, I hope you could put that in your testimony. <laughs> but I, I told them I'll, I'll mention it in my verbal testimony. So that's it. I'm not, you know, just so that there's no double dipping. And the reason why we say no double dipping because there may be some small contractors that may not, that may not apply for the Gita QC for this if this law if this bill comes into law. They may not want to go through the bureaucracy, the bureaucratic process, and all that stuff. And if they, do, if they don't get a QC, they won't qualify to transfer that BPT to their client or to their customer. And that customer then will then be avail themselves to the regular down payment program that Guam Housing administers, where, if funds available. So that's the two difference. There'll be one that's sustainable, one that's based on funds available on the general fund when you guys, if there's any more street of funds every end of December as the banks advertise. So therefore, I support the intent of the bill. Uh, again, I, uh, I'd like to thank the original founder that gave us the movement 26 years ago, uh, your dad, Francis Santos, and the many people in between that, uh, that was a modifying the many affordable housing bill from uh, Tina Barnes, Speaker Wampat, Tony Lamarena, right? And you know what you guys just did recently this year? Uh, this body had amended the Chamorro Land Trust law. Uh, so now financing and funding for construction activity for their homes could happen. If this happened, this could be an infusion for these families, thousands of these families. I'm just talking about one market that can have access to some type of assistance in their closing costs. So therefore, I hope that we can get your support in moving this, uh, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Camacho. Um, totally different from what I <laughs> Yes. A little bit of difference, but, but I know you're going to fix that. Senator Tidegu, would you like to ask a question now, or we'll ask Senator Frank, and then I will leave you for questions and closing. Senator Bloss, do you have any questions for the folks? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for, for being here. And um, Carlos, thank you very much. Yeah, I read your letter and listened to your testimony. Thanks. I got full, well, well around it, okay? <laughs> Smart move, okay? And um, thank you, uh, Uncle Carlos, okay? And uh, Matt, thank you also. Um, am I reading this wrong? Is this, this bill is basically to be able to create and to build homes. Is that what this bill is for? Basically? That? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, and I, I asked that question because, uh, you know, Mr. Chair, and... Uh, while Guam Housing isn't here, I did read Guam Housing's uh, uh, testimony uh, on this thing, and, and a lot of it was reference to the financing or, you know, the, the availability, the affordability of the home to the homeowner. When I was looking at the bill, and it's the affordability of the builder to build the home and the, the ability to build the home. So I just want to make that, that very clear, that that's what this bill is for. Is for like you said, Carlos, this is basically expand the opportunity 
um, you know, to build the homes at, at, a, at a rate that is affordable for individuals to be able to purchase the homes. Am I correct in that? Carlos? Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. You're Mr. Correct. Mr. Camacho. Okay. Is, is the, the bill basically is, is to expand the opportunity and the, abil uh, and the ability um, to be able to build homes so that it becomes affordable for individuals who in, you know, less than opportune times can't afford to purchase a home. Is that, am I correct? Senator, that's correct. And the reason we decided to do a five to 24 minute threshold at smaller contractors or the operators, in the past decade, we've been seeing the same thing to barrier to housing. Right. The lack of down payment and closing costs, and this is why Senator Pangolina introduced that many, many years ago. But you know, we had to find a sustainable source. But we, if you make a smaller operator involved, their overhead and operation is not as big as the big time player with the military build up. It's costing the cost of goods to go up. Right. In theory, we're hoping that these small guys, if if we educate these guys out there that there are some tax benefits for them, then the cost of their construction costs will go down. And the great news is the H2 workers, if we, we don't have workers in Guam, for the definition of housing is approved by UCI, UCIS to bring in. So these guys will have access to the workforce uh, in that. And as a smaller contractor, their overhead and cost of operation supposedly is supposed to be a lot more affordable, okay. but I'm not a... <laughs> no, and I appreciate it, and that's what, again, the theory, yeah. you know, and the concept, uh, and it seems something that I feel is viable and, and something that we should re really look into. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Berdalio, I can, I, can, I can understand Gita's concern, and, you know, we, we do have, in fact, two entities, you know, other than Gita to be able to deal with, the, you know, the housing issue. The financing issue I can understand, but the, in as far as the implementation and the and, and the administration of the program, okay, I I I, I, can, I can agree with that. Um, but um, I appreciate the the testimony. I appreciate you bringing the concern. I think there is a happy medium to that, as Mr. Camacho has stated, to be able to move this forward. Uh, I am not, you know, not I am in support of this bill, as is evident with my you know co-sponsorship of this thing. We need to find a way to be able to bring, you know, um, housing costs down. And if this is a way to be able to capture that by, this is truly, you know, uh, creative writing to be able to find that loop one. I want to thank you, you know, for Mr. Camacho for, for being able to look at that. I want to thank the sponsor, uh, the author of this, this, this legislation, um, you know, and, and being able to uh, want, want to move this forward. I, I you know, with the recommend, re recommended uh, change proposal in as far as the administration as you have suggested, is it my understanding then that Gita has no problem with this? Yeah, that's correct, Senator. Uh, we recommend that um, Guam Housing actually administer okay. the program. Okay. And we could, we, we could be there to assist them in, in the financing portion. Okay. Yeah. Carlos, Mr. Camacho, sounds good for you too with that? Yeah, uh, Guam Housing has the framework and format. Okay. And the only thing is, is we just have to separate the two different programs, I would, which is easy to yeah. cut the pie in that one. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we, 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 you know, we identify what the impediment is and we try to remove it. And thank you for the testimony and being able to do this. So I think that can be done. And, um, and in the committee, yes. And Senator, if I, if I can add to that. Um, so uh, basically the way that I think Gita sees it is obviously the underwriting of the tax, the QC application mm -hmm. um, is something Gita can handle. You know, we have rules and regs, everything's in place, SOPs. Um, it's, the, it's the second part of the housing fund that I think what would happen is, optimally I think the best way would happen is if and when the bill becomes law and the program is stood up, Basically, if um, a contractor or a developer were to come in and apply for this QC, they would say, okay, um, a requirement of this QC would be to move the BPT over to this, into, this, into this program. You would have to comply with this program 
uh, in order to avail of the tax benefits the QC offers. That's how the bill is written right now. Basically says you get income tax and your use tax. You also must take your, your BPTs must go into this separate fund. Um, notwithstanding the, the issues, the, 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 the highlight of unpledged versus pledged, uh, whatever system is set up, then if and when a QC is issued, um, it would state, okay, as a condition of receiving this QC for this specific 58128.7, you need to do this, you need to go to Guam Housing, for example, fill out the form, comply, do whatever you need to do there. You need to provide proof that you're complying with that program, and then that would be part of the QC, like, compliance process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. kind of interesting because I was, I was looking at your QC program yesterday yeah. for another reason, and I, I can appreciate it. Yeah. I fully understand that, that, yeah. that, that process. But I also have to agree with Mr. Camacho in that, you know, uh, you know, if there is concern from anybody with regards to uh, reducing the, the, you know, the, the, the business privilege tax, and the, you know, the, uh, this, is, this is new business. This is new income. Okay? And so, you know, basically, it's a wash. I mean, it's, it's not, it hasn't been obligated or hasn't been in, 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 you know, in the future and stuff. It hasn't even happened. Okay? So I, I think that, you know, we, I, I think you properly addressed that concern. Mr. Komacho, do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, I just want, yes, it is new BPT that's created from that layer of contractor. Uh -huh. But that contractor who buys goods from Home Depot or JK Tile. They still pay it. Or goes to the escrow, at the title, title guarantee, Pacific American uh -huh. title, all those stuff. All those guys pay GRT that we're not exempting from here. Yeah, I appreciate it. So those GRT are newly created, right. but the layer that we're using is what's going to spur that economic multiplier. Yeah, and I appreciate it. That's, that's why I'm excited about this, okay? and I think that it can work. But thank you very much for the, for, for the testimony, and thank you to the author for being able to, to not only to introduce it, but allow me to, to be a co-sponsor to this. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Blas. You know, I'm in support of this program. I've always been supportive of finding affordable homes. And Carlos and I have talked about many other programs. We just got to go through one at a time and put the package together so it sells. One of the only concern I'm concerned about is that um, hopefully when they, go, when they go to Gita, Gita has a list of all these contractors and that if they want to say they're going to build five homes, it's not one today, it's five homes to be built. The reason why I say that because in certain areas on Guam, you have developers that I, I think are, prying, are trying to escape the community requirement that if you build so many homes, you got to help with the infrastructure. Why do we have a two-inch pipe in this area and all of a sudden we have 10 brand new homes? But they build it like get a permit once every six months or eight months so they can avoid that requirement. Public. Maybe we need to strengthen that somehow. But I'm hoping that the contractors that participate in these five homes are not large contractors to begin with, and they scale down so they can take advantage of it. We need to focus on the small contractors, the contractors that need the help, need to get in the business. Not be always subcontracted, but be a contractor and be able to do this. And that's the only thing I'm concerned about, is making sure that whoever's going to do this um, you know, the double dipping, we can fix that. I'll work with, with the author of the bill. We'll, we'll, make, we'll make the amendments that need to be made to protect the people of Guam, to protect the developers and so forth. But I'm just concerned about the, making sure there's community involvement. You know, when I say community involvement, if you're going to build five homes and you know there's only a two-inch pipe coming in there, water pipe, put, for both, put in front of four-inch pipe because the homes that are further in are going to suffer because you sucked up all the water and water pressure. That's what I'm looking at. If there's a sewer line, upgrade the sewer line in the area you're putting in. Connect to the sewer line so we don't look at septic tanks in these areas. Put for both, it's not that far. Let's work. Because I, I know that Senator Tidy is focused on, let's help the people. But let's not rob Peter to feed Paul. Let's work, make it all work for everybody. It's a plus up. This is a great bill. I'm in full support of this bill right at this point. As long as it's focused, there's no double dipping. I'll, as I said, I'll work with the author and we'll make it work. And then from there on, we'll move on. Senator Tideway, I have no further questions or further comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, um, first I would like to thank, you know, Senator Blas for, you know, he, when I spoke to him about this bill, there was no hesitation whatsoever. 
um, he realizes the, the need for homes on Guam, and especially affordable homes. So I'd like to thank him. But I, I also like to invite Senator Snogestine. You know, he was off island during that time during a family emergency. Um, I knew he wanted to be a co-sponsor, so <laughs> I'd like to incorporate him as a co-sponsor to this bill because, of course, you know, it's from his father to himself, you know, uh, continuing the legacy of, of affordable homes on Guam is, is very important. But most especially, I'd like to thank Guam Housing for providing the testimony, Gita for being here today, and of course, Mr. Carlos Camacho, you know, the guru of all development and housing and, you know, every one of us that sit up here, if we had a question, the first person we call is, you know, um, is Carlos Camacho because of your background, all the information, I mean, working uh, tirelessly with, with the community and providing homes for our, our people. Unfortunately, we ha can't do anything about inflation. We can't do anything about you know, the cost of goods going up. Um, that's something this body can't do. But what we can do is find a way to, to increase the inventory. Because like anything, if you increase the inventory, the prices will go down. But when there's hardly no inventory on this island, of course these homes are going to be so super expensive. So that's the first thing. We need to increase the inventory. And then what the government of Guam can do is provide uh, tax incentives so that people who, who want to own a home, who actually have the means to pay their mortgage, but they just don't have that down payment of $15,000, you know, to fork out. That's the hardest part. I mean, people today live paycheck to paycheck. Sometimes it's even worse than that. They're living on... You know, last week's paycheck, and the week before or the two weeks before to try and catch up and they can't seem to catch up. In the meantime, we're seeing more homeless people on the street. We're seeing more families moving in with each other, three families in one home. Something has to be done. And this, this is what this bill and those co-sponsors and now Senator Snogestine be a co-sponsor. And I, again, I thank Senator Frank Bloss for jumping on this right away and all, all my other co-sponsors. I don't want to leave them out. But we need to do our part. Gentlemen, Gita, Guam Housing, let's get together and make these amendments so that we do it correctly. We're not breaking any laws and we're encouraging these investors on Guam to continue to invest on our island for our people. So do us mostly, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much again for everyone being here. Merry Christmas to everybody. This is a good start. Okay. Thank you, Senator Taidegui. With that, um, there is no other individuals to testify. On Bill 348-36LS, the committee will receive, will continue to receive testimony as required and as needed. I will wait for the, uh, the author to, to provide any additional amendments she, she would recommend, and we'll just make, prepare a committee report so we can submit it to the Committee on Rules and get it on the floors whenever it's possible. Um, you may submit your testimony to the mayor room of the Guam Legislature or through email at senatorjoesanogsin at gmail.com. Again, I want to thank everyone for attending this public hearing and for providing feedback and suggestion. Bill number 348-36 is duly heard by the committee and the public hearing is now adjourned. It is now 10.50. Jesus Marcy and Merry Christmas. Please be safe. Take care.